Dr. Rico here. This is a lecture from my course on robotics. The syllabus link is in the description. Welcome to Dynamic Models, a lecture from the Robot Mechanics chapter. A decent amount of robotics can be done with kinematics alone. With inverse kinematics and a dash of feedback control, we can even control a robot's motion by prescribing its joint actuators to move to a given configuration. However, a robot designer would have many important questions unanswerable by kinematics. These include the following. One, how accurately can the end effector be posed? Two, how quickly can the robot move from one configuration, Q1, to another, Q2? Three, how much force or impulse could the robot exert on a human who happened to enter its workspace? Four, how much payload can, a, can the robot handle? Five, which motors should be selected to actuate the joints? For instance, how much capacity, power, capacity should they be able to handle? How much torque do they need? Etc. How much power does the robot need to operate? That was six. Seven, if the robot is accidentally commanded to a configuration that would damage it or its environment, what happens? Eight, how do the weights of the different components affect the considerations above? All these pertain to force and acceleration, that is, dynamics. A dynamic model can help answer these and many related questions important to the designer. You may have noticed that one of the questions above pertain to the robot's safety for nearby humans. In some highly controlled environments, this may seem less important, but as robots interact more with humans working collaboratively, it becomes paramount. With a kinematics-only model, position control is the only option. This means the joints are commanded to try as they might to match the commanded configuration. If something unforeseen arises, like an obstacle, the robot may deliver a great deal of force or impulse to that obstacle, resulting in a great deal of damage to the robot, obstacle, or, God forbid, a person. And that has happened. This greatly limits the possibilities of application for a position-controlled robot. Fortunately, there is a better way. Force control. Force control uses force and torque sensors as feedback and commands force and torque in lieu of position. Robots with force control are usually much safer. However, specific configurations are still important goals for control, so a mixture of the two types is usually necessary. Dynamic formations. It turns out there are several ways to formulate Newtonian dynamics. There are three important variations. The Newton-Euler formulation. This is a systematic version of the familiar summing of forces causing translational motion called the Newton equation and summing of moments causing rotational motion called the Euler equation. Each link contributes one of each a Newton equation and an Euler equation to the set of equations of motion. Solution of these equations proceeds by recursively solving for link velocities and accelerations, translational and rotational, then back propagating these to solve for forces and torques. This method has the advantages that it is based on the traditionally taught formulation, so you're familiar with it, and is computationally efficient. However, it is somewhat more complicated to set up and doesn't extend as well. The Euler-Lagrange formulation. This formulation is coordinate independent and relies on a special function called the Lagrangian. L, typically denoted, that is the system's kinetic energy T minus its potential energy U, i.e. T minus U. One way of formulating this, and there are many, 
is in terms of time t, positions q, and velocities v, such that L, the Lagrangian, is a function of time, position, and velocity. The formulation then proceeds via the calculus of variations, a mathematics of path optimization. Why? Because the Euler-Lagrange equations of motion are a necessary condition for least action, where action, a, a function of the Lagrangian, is an integral function of the Lagrangian along different paths. This is an example of the oft relied upon principle of least action that has had conspicuous success in deriving mathematical models of physical phenomena. The principle leads to the following necessary condition for least action called the Euler-Lagrange equations. We have this time derivative of these partial derivatives of the Lagrangian with respect to the velocity coordinates, and this other term that's negative that are the partial derivatives of the Lagrangian with respect to the spatial coordinates. Now, there are n equations, one for each coordinate, uh, i in this list of n indices. So this is a set of n equations of motion. This formulation has the advantages that it is relatively straightforward to deploy and can be extended to flexible bodies. However, it does not lend itself to computation in the way the Newton-Euler formulation does. The Hamilton formulation, the third and final formulation, a Hamilton formulation has its own function of kinetic and potential energy of the system called the, you guessed it, Hamiltonian, H, defined as T plus U. As with the Lagrangian, derivatives of the Hamiltonian yield the equations of motion. An excellent and advanced treatment of Hamiltonian mechanics for control is given by Bloch, Krishna Prasad and Murray I recommend it direct and inverse dynamics in the direct dynamics problem we solve the usual dynamics problem formulated here in terms of a configuration vector Q a function of time what accelerations Q double dot velocities Q dot positions Q and end effector forces will the system have through time when it starts with an initial condition and is subjected to prescribed forces and torques typically applied by joint actuators. So that's the direct dynamics problem. Solving this problem is essential to the simulation of a robot and is therefore extremely helpful for robot design. In the inverse dynamics problem, we solve instead for the actuator torques and forces required for a given configuration, Q of T, velocity, Q dot of T, and acceleration, Q double dot of T, and end effector forces. Solving the inverse dynamics problem is important for configuration trajectory, position and velocity, planning and control, especially force control, as we discussed earlier, because it connects trajectory with force and torque so you know how they relate now okay that's all i've got for you on this lecture see you next time